We're outside the Museum of London in Docklands to explore how interpreting the landscape can help us to tell different stories about the cultural legacies of slavery. The Museum of London Docklands is situated in one of the old sugar warehouses that made up part of the West India Dock complex. It was built in order to facilitate ships within the West India trade. The West India trade at that time was made up of slave-produced commodities. Up until 1807, this space also served as a port in the Atlantic slave trade. So the history of this area is very much tied up with the history of slavery. The docks themselves were built after a campaign which was spearheaded by two men. Those two men's histories can be read directly in the landscape today. George Hibbert was a West India merchant whose family traded in enslaved people in Jamaica. Robert Milligan was a slave trader in Jamaica and also a West India merchant. There are symbols of these two men all around the museum. The first is Hibbert's Gate. Hibbert's Gate formerly served as the entrance to the docks and when it was built, George Hibbert selected a model ship to go on the top of the gate. The ship was the Hibbert's, which was a ship owned by his family which served within the West India trade. To the side of the museum you can find an ornamental stone which commemorates the activities of Hibbert and Milligan. The stone celebrates uncritically the two men as ornamenting British commerce. Finally, there's the statue of Robert Milligan himself. The statue sits upon a plinth and on that plinth is depicted a classical scene of commerce bringing prosperity to Britannia. As a modern audience, what we have to ask ourselves is what does it mean to uncritically celebrate West India trade when we know that this is simply a euphemistic term for the slave economy. Altogether, these different symbols tell us much about the ways in which the slaving past shaped the local area but without any signage to enable people to publicly understand what these symbols mean, the centrality of this history to London is lost. It's only by entering the museum space that we can begin to understand and unpick the complicated histories and legacies of slavery that the signs and symbols outside of the museum represent. Part of the reason why the Museum of London Docklands has chosen to house this exhibition is because the very material space of the museum, as well as its collections, owes a debt to the cultural legacies of slavery. There are many different local conversations that have been happening in Liverpool, in London, but also in Bristol, and perhaps this example is the one that's most well known. I'm joined today by Dr. Christy Warren, who is a specialist in the history and legacies of transatlantic slavery. And Christy, could you tell us a little bit more about some of those histories and some of those campaigns? Edward Colston was an investor and a member of the London-based Royal Africa Company. The Royal Africa Company was a key company in the trade in enslaved people from Africa to the Americas. He was with that company for 12 years, during which time thousands of African people were trafficked to the Americas. He wanted people to remember him as a kind, generous person. However, in doing this, he erased the memory of his slave trading past. He erased the fact that that is how he made his money. Countering Colston is working to bring that history to light. They want to have public spaces reflect the history of the broad spectrum of people who live in Bristol. So the example of Colston and Bristol is just one example of many, so it's a much broader national conversation. And I wondered if you could possibly say something around what you think is important about that national conversation and some of the issues that it's bringing up. Traditionists will say that by contesting these monuments, we're trying to alter the past. Instead, what we're trying to do is show the parts of the past that have been ignored. In particular, in this case, we're talking about the histories of enslaved people and what they contributed to the nation. So we're not just talking about adding information to monuments that exist or tearing down these monuments. We're also thinking about the monuments that haven't been built, the monuments that we should have to enslaved people. Some of these issues have been taken up by modern artists, black British artists here in the UK. One of these artists is Lubaina Himid. Lubaina was the first black British woman to win the Turner Prize, and this was just last year. In her work, Lubaina reflects on our past, including slavery. In a piece called What Are Monuments For, 
She thinks about what our urban landscape would look like here in London, also in Paris, if the enslaved were remembered. In her work, she is asking us to remember the past as it was and to give the enslaved their place within it. In the end, Himid asks, who are monuments for?